Thanks very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, so this is a joint work uh, with Ciprian Manolescu and Lisa Picirillo. So I would like to start uh, by telling you some background. And in particular, I would like to tell you about two classical problems. The first problem that I would like to tell you about uh, is called the minimum genus problem. So suppose that you have uh, a four manifold X and uh, we're interested in uh, surfaces property uh, in uh, embedded surfaces in X, uh, smooth surfaces in X. And we ask uh, what is the minimum genus of Sigma? But we actually want to put a condition also on the uh, homology class of Sigma. So the question precisely is the following. Suppose that X is a smooth closed fourth manifold and alpha is a homology class in X, then what is the minimum genus of a smooth embedded surface in X with, uh, in the homology class of alpha? There are some uh, landmark results of uh, gauge theory addressing uh, uh, this problem. The first one is the Thom conjecture, which was proved by Kronheimer and Rovka, which states that if sigma is a surface uh, embedded in CP2 with, uh, uh, just one second maybe. Sorry, that shouldn't be a problem anymore. Okay, uh, so yes, let's, uh, if sigma is a surface in CP2, uh, in the homology class of D times uh, CP1, then uh, the genus of sigma is uh, at least uh, D minus one times D minus two divided by two. So if you know the degree genus formula in algebraic geometry, then this tells uh, uh, that actually algebraic curves in CP2 are genus minimizing in the homology class because the inequality is actually an inequality for, uh, uh, for algebraic curves. Then the Tom conjecture was also generalized to a symplectic set setting by Oshvat and Sabo who proved that actually any symplectic surface in any closed symplectic for manifold X is genus minimizing in its homology class. And there's actually some uh, uh, generalization also for manifolds with boundary, with contact convex boundary and uh, the boundary of sigma being transverse. The second classical problem that I would like to mention is the problem of uh, the slice genus. So first off, uh, the slice genus is a problem about knots and a knot is by definition an embedding of S1 inside S3 up to isotopy. So here are some examples. I wasn't sure how much people are familiar with knots. So this is a picture of the unknot. This is a picture of the right-handed trefoil. And this is a picture of the left-handed trefoil. So these are the three simplest knots uh, you can have. And uh, if you have a knot sitting inside S3, which I pictured uh, here, then uh, you always know that S3 is the boundary of a four ball before, and you can always find the surface uh, sigma embedded inside V4, such that the boundary of sigma is exactly K. And now you may ask, uh, what is the minimum uh, genus of uh, such a surface? And that is by definition, the slice genus. So the slice genus of K uh, denoted by G4 of K 
is the minimum genus of a surface sigma smoothly embedded in the four ball with boundary the not k. And it is a classical problem to determine the four ball genus, uh, the slice genus uh, of a not k. This is also called uh, the four ball genus sometimes. A very special case in when the, is when the surface sigma is a disk, in which case we say that the knot is slice or classically slice. So this is uh, when G4 is equal to zero or equivalently, if K bounds a smoothly embedded disk in the four ball. So this disk uh, delta will also be called uh, a slice disk. And just by notation, uh, just a notational uh, remark, uh, during this talk, I will uh, use the letter sigma for a surface and delta for a disk. All right, so are there any questions so far? This was just a recap of two classical problems. Is there a simple classification of the uh, sliced knot? No, um, no, there isn't a simple classification. Um, so if you take a knot and its mirror, say the, uh, the left-handed trefoil and the right-handed trefoil, and uh, you connect them, uh, you take the connected sum of them, then you certainly get uh, a slice knot, uh, but not all knots are of this form. Um, yeah, so no, it, it is actually a rather complicated subject. Thank you. Okay, so then I would move uh, to the question that we address in this talk, which is uh, a mix uh, of the two classical problems uh, I have uh, outlined. So the situation is the following. We have a four manifold X, some uh, closed four manifold X. We puncture it, that is we remove a four ball. Then we get uh, these, uh, these four manifold, which I called X punctured, X uh, with an upper circle. Uh, its boundary is S3, and let's suppose that I have a knot K in this S3, then I, I am interested uh, in the surfaces uh, sigma that this knot can bound. So the question is the following, given a closed smooth four manifold X with uh, uh, and a knot K in S3 and some fixed homology class alpha, then what is the minimum genus of a smooth properly embedded surface in X punctured with uh, boundary K and such that the homology class of sigma uh, is alpha. Uh, so here, sigma really lives in the relative uh, second homology of uh, X punctured, but this is canonically isomorphic uh, to the second homology of X. And this is really a generalization of both classical problems because if you set uh, K to be the simplest possible knot, namely the unknot, then you recover uh, the problem uh, of the minimum genus surface because you can always cap off uh, an unknot with a disk. And so you just get this smoothly embedded surface sigma, which is now closed. And if instead uh, you consider the simplest possible four manifold, namely the four sphere, then once you remove a four ball, you get another four ball. So, um, so you recover uh, the slice genus problem. Sorry, are you assuming that X is simply connected or something? Because um, I'm concerned by your canonical isomorphism. Oh, I see. Yeah. Uh, okay, I mean, yeah, we can assume that X is simply connected. Um, you're just, but you're just gluing in a four handle. So that sh really shouldn't oh, affect sorry, the sorry, I misread homology. The okay, so it sorry, doesn't really yeah. matter. Yeah, no, it's, sorry, I mis misread the, I forgot, I, I, yeah, I misread your notation. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Never mind. OK, 
Okay, so let's uh, move to some definitions. I want to generalize the concept of sliceness to other four manifolds. So we'll say that a knot is slice in X if it bounds uh, a smoothly embedded disk delta in X punctured. And I will say that it is H slice where H stands for uh, homologically slice if that disk is null homologous. So as a remark, in the case of uh, X being S4, both uh, uh, notions uh, just recover the classical sliceness, uh, uh, the, the classical definition of sliceness. So now I would like to move to some background of sliceness, unless there are any questions. Okay, so as you can see, the question that I would like to address is why is sliceness so important? I've already defined it uh, even for uh, different four manifolds. Uh, and uh, here is uh, a um, very pers uh, a personal perspective on why I consider sliceness important. It is definitely not the only reason why it is important. So SPC4 is the smooth Poincare conjecture in dimension four. One equivalent formulation of it says that uh, if X is a smooth four manifold homeomorphic to S4, then it is diffeomorphic to S4. It is the last uh, standing case uh, of the generalized uh, Poincare conjecture. And there's a proposed strategy to disprove it by Friedman, Gomf, Morrison, and Walker, which goes as follows. Suppose that we can find a knot, which is a slice in X, in some X which is homeomorphic to S4, but not in the standard four sphere. Well, then X and S4 must be obviously uh, different from each other. So here somehow I am hoping, or Friedman, uh, Gomp, Morrison and Walker are hoping to see the different uh, diffeomorphism type of X and S4 by considering the smoothly embedded surfaces uh, sitting inside it. There is no guarantee that this will work. Actually, I should say, I'm not really sure uh, uh, about what people think about the smooth Poincaré conjecture in dimension four. I think some people think it's true. Uh, many people think it's false, but I think that opinions are sp pretty split about it. Uh, maybe 10 years ago, it was more, uh, uh, people, were more inclined to think that uh, it was false. So now I see a split in opinions. So we say that, uh, uh, okay, so we say that uh, uh, two such manifolds, X uh, and uh, S4, uh, would be an exotic pair because they are homeomorphic to each other, but not diffeomorphic. And this can be generalized also to four manifolds that are not necessarily homeomorphic to the four sphere. So suppose uh, we say that two four manifolds X and X prime as, are an exotic pair if they are homeomorphic, but not diffeomorphic. And exotic pairs uh, do exist. So we do not, we do, do not know if uh, they exist uh, when one of them is the four sphere, but they definitely exist in general. This was first uh, this was firstly proved uh, by Donaldson, and uh, maybe a simpler question uh, than the smooth four-dimensional Poincaré conjecture is: uh, Can you detect uh, any exotic pair using sliceness or uh, uh, H sliceness? And while uh, the first question regarding sliceness remains elusive, we have no idea if this is true or not. We can prove that the answer to the second question with H sliceness is yes. So more precisely, this is the theorem, uh, one of the theorems that we prove with uh, Ciprian and Lisa. There exists uh, an exotic pair of manifolds X and X prime and a knot in S3 such that uh, 
the not k is h slice in uh, uh, in x prime but not in x again h slice means that it bounds a null homologous a smoothly embedded disk and the minimal working example that we could find is the following you can choose x to be the k3 surface blown up once x prime a homeomorphic, uh, a four manifold homeomorphic to it, which is given by 20 CP2 bars and uh, the three CP2s. And K can be taken to be the right handed trefoil. So here I should mention that uh, um, this fact was actually already known if you assume that uh, your four manifolds have boundary, not uh, have some non trivial boundary. Um, but instead, uh, the difficult part, I would say, of, uh, uh, of this result is that we work with closed four manifolds, or after you puncture them, manifolds uh, with boundary S3. And I also want to emphasize the fact that we work uh, in the smooth category. In fact, uh, you could have also defined uh, topologically sliceness, topologically H sliceness, uh, and yeah, uh, using locally flat disks uh, and locally flat embeddings. Uh, but this is not helpful uh, in detecting exotic pairs uh, because topological sliceness and topological H sliceness uh, do not change under homeomorphism. Okay, so I would like to go over some examples just to have a sense of what sliceness in four manifolds can tell. So I will uh, denote by S of X, uh, the set of knots that are sliced in X, by SH of X, uh, the set of knots that are H slice in X, and by K, the set of all knots uh, in, S, uh, in S3. So K is just the set of all knots. Then, uh, of course, uh, there are going to be some uh, uh, some inclusions. So the first one, the first element, the first set here is the set of uh, slice knots uh, in S4, uh, or equivalently classically slice uh, uh, knots. If you have a classically uh, slice knot, then this is always uh, H slice uh, in every four manifold X. And this is because it is essentially uh, it bounds a disk in, uh, uh, in a color of the boundary. Then uh, the set of H slice knots uh, is always contained in the set of slice knots because for H slice knots, uh, we also re we add a requirement. We require that the disk uh, be null homologous. And of course, the set of uh, slice knots in X is contained inside the set of all knots. So let's see some examples. So the first example is uh, S4. For S4, we have that uh, uh, the set of uh, H slice knots and the set of slice knots uh, are the same as uh, S, uh, and they are the same as S of S4, of course. And these are not the set of all knots. So there are knots uh, that are not slice in S4. Uh, uh, one example is uh, the trefoil. So the right-handed trefoil, which we have already seen, uh, is not uh, uh, a slice knot. Then other examples are S1 cross S3 and T4. These are, are other four manifolds. But now it turns out that their, uh, uh, their universal uh, cover is S4, uh, or, uh, well, uh, okay, for, sorry, for T4, uh, the, the universal cover is, uh, sorry, the universal cover is not S4. Uh, for, S, for T4, it is R4, but somehow it can be compactified to S4. And for S1 cross S3, uh, you get uh, R cross S3, and again, this is uh, contained inside uh, S4. 
And so this implies that if a knot is a slice or H slice in any of these manifolds, then it is actually also slice in S4, so classically slice. So also for these manifolds, you get that the set of H slice knots and the set of slice knots is not particularly interesting. Now, a more interesting example is given by S2 cross S2. So in the case of S2 cross S2, we actually have that all knots are slice. This was proved by Suzuki. And then the other two inclusions are both non-trivial. So we see that all inclusions uh, can be strict. There is actually at least one case where all the three inclusions are strict, and that's CP2. In the case of CP2, all of the inclusions uh, are not equalities. So here, some examples are given by the right-handed trefoil, which is H slice in CP2, but not classically slice. The left-handed trefoil, which is slice, but not H slice. And then the difficult one is to find a knot which is not slice at all. And one example is the torus knot T2 minus 15, which Yasuhara proved uh, not to be uh, slice in CP2. Now for uh, what we do, we focus on indefinite four manifolds. That is for, ooh, disaster. Okay. Uh, so four many, so the writings just went one over the other. Okay, sorry about that. So indefinite four manifolds are four manifolds uh, uh, such that the intersection form is uh, indefinite. And the intersection form is a form on H2 modulo torsion, where uh, given by uh, given as follows, you take representatives sigma one and sigma two for two classes of H lower two modulo torsion, and uh, uh, you pair them by taking uh, the algebraic count of uh, uh, their intersections, assuming that they are transverse to each other. One example of it that is non-trivial is the K3 surface. So I've decided, we have decided to choose the K3 surface because the K3 surface is a rather simple object, but still it's not a connected sum of CP2s or CP2 bars or S2 cross S2s. So how can we define the K3 surface? Uh, there are several ways There are, you can define it using uh, algebraic geometry. Uh, you can say it is a Lefschetz vibration. Uh, as a topologist, uh, this is a definition I like. Um, so by this picture, I mean that uh, I am considering uh, the four ball and then I am attaching uh, the four ball, which has boundary S3. And in S3, there is a link, which you see pictured on the right. And then you attach two cells on this B4 according uh, to, the, uh, to the link. So you attach a two cell for each component of the link. So you actually get 22 two cells. And then you close with, uh, um, with the four cell. Now, because you want everything to be a four manifold also at each step, you really want to thicken your two cells. And so you actually call them two handles rather than two cells. Um, I'm sure many people here are already very familiar with handles, but maybe not everyone is. But uh, okay, so this is somehow a very streamlined construction of K3. And now for the K3 surface, 
We know that uh, there are knots uh, that are H slice in K3, but not in, uh, um, but not classically slice. So this, this is a construction that can be done with whited doubles, for instance. Then there are uh, knots that are uh, uh, slice in K3, but not H slice in K3. And one example is the left-handed trefoil. And then it is an open question, uh, meaning that we couldn't find an answer, um, whether there are knots uh, that are not slice uh, in K3 at all. Uh, we don't have any example. I think a problem here is that uh, we could prove that every knot uh, with a knotting number uh, less than or equal to two is a slice in K3. So if you want uh, an example of a knot uh, that might not be slice in K3, you have to go up uh, with, uh, um, with the unknotting number. So you, you need to find knots that are pretty complicated. And maybe a remark about sliceness in K3 is that the left-handed trefoil uh, is slice, as we said. And actually, it is rather easy to see a slice disk of the left-handed trifle. We can see it from the picture up here because there's uh, a handle, uh, sorry, there is uh, a component of the link uh, in the picture here, which looks exactly like the trifle. Now, when we construct K3, we're attaching a two cell along, uh, uh, along this curve. So the two cell is clearly a disk with boundary uh, the with boundary, the component uh, of this link. So here is the component I am talking about. Now, if you pay attention to what you get, you actually get uh, a disc with boundary trefoil. And uh, there's a little uh, care to be taken to make sure that it is the left-handed trifle or the right-handed trifle. Turns out that after you adjust for all the conventions, you get that the left-handed trifle is a, a slice in K3. And uh, one property of this disk is that uh, under the intersection form, uh, it squares to zero, but it is not null homologous. So we will need this fact later. How are we doing so far? I'm more or less halfway through. Is that okay, time-wise? Excellent. All right, so now I would like to go over some previously known results from the literature. So there are already some results about sliceness uh, in the literature or uh, just finding genus bounds, uh, uh, relative genus bounds, genus bounds uh, for um, surfaces uh, bounding a certain knot. And one case where many things are known is when X is a definite four manifold. So when X is a definite four manifold, for instance, there's an adjunction inequality by Oshvat and Sabo that says that sigma squared plus the L1 norm of sigma is bounded by the genus of sigma minus a quantity that depends on the knot and that arises from Hegar fluoromology. There is also a version of it for instant on fluoromology, but when sigma is null homologous and actually with uh, the stronger property that you can homotope it uh, to the boundary of X zero. So here, uh, the new quantity is S sharp, which is uh, some instanton, uh, uh, some quantity coming from in instanton fluoromology, which is a relative of tau essentially. And then there is also a similar adjunction inequality uh, that formally looks uh, very similar to the previous two using Covano homology, uh, which Ciprian, Sucherit, Mike, and I proved uh, a couple of years ago. And this actually doesn't work for every definite four manifold. Well, maybe it does, but we don't know. Uh, what we could prove is that it works for connected sums of CP2 bar 
but I should say that at the moment, uh, there are no examples uh, of uh, definite, uh, well, let's say simply connected uh, definite four manifolds, which are not connected sums uh, of uh, CP2s uh, or connected sums of CP2 bars, depending whether you choose the positive or the negative orientation. So since there are already many bounds for definite four manifolds, uh, we decided to study the indefinite side. And uh, then I should also mention that there are also some topological bounds. But topological bounds don't work very well for us because they work equally well for uh, locally flat surfaces in topological four manifolds. So, so they don't really uh, say anything about uh, the smooth structure of your four manifold, as I mentioned. So let's revise some of them. Um, so the first one is uh, a generalization of uh, Rocklin's theorem, which in the most general form, uh, which, appear, which is a combination actually of Friedman, Kirby, and probably also of Klug. I should also add Klug here, maybe. Says that if sigma is a characteristic vector in the intersection lattice, then uh, the Rf invariant of K plus the Rf invariant of X relative to the surface sigma plus the signature of sigma minus sigma squared divided by eight plus the Kirby Siebelman invariant of X is even. Now there's a lot of uh, objects in here and I'm not going to define them. I just would like to mention that uh, the Rf invariant of X relative to sigma is zero if sigma is a disk and the Kirby Siebenman invariant of X is zero if X is smooth. So by this fact, we recover a classical theorem by Robertello from the 60s, I think, uh, that uh, if K is an H slice uh, not in, K, in the K3 surface, then the Rf invariant is congruent to zero mod two. And this is because uh, if K is H slice, then sigma squared is equal to zero. So this goes to zero. And the signature of K3 is congruent uh, to 16 uh, mod eight because K3 is a spin. Uh, actually it is exactly 16. So this is six plus or minus 16, depending on the orientation you choose. I guess minus 16 is the classical one. Uh, and so you get that the Rf invariant must be even. So, this already says something interesting because it says, uh, disaster, that uh, the left-handed trifoil or also the right-handed trifoil are not H slice in K3 because the Rf invariant is one. There are also topological bounds coming from uh, signatures. So one is by Conway and Nagel, which says that uh, if the first homology of X is zero and sigma is null homologous, then for almost all uh, complex numbers of norm one, there's an inequality that is written here involving uh, the Tristram Levine signatures of K, uh, the signature of sigma, uh, the signature of uh, X, B2 of X and the genus of sigma. B2 of X is the, bet the second Betty number. And there's a related result by Rocklin, Vero, and Gilmer. So the first one was by Rocklin, and then it was generalized by Vero and Gilmer, which, uh, uh, which works also for non-null homologous sigma, but uh, you, it doesn't work for almost every complex number of norm one, but it works for uh, roots of unity, basically. And both uh, these results say that uh, if K is an H slice knot uh, in the K3 surface, then uh, there is a signature uh, uh, restriction, namely that the signature of K has to be between minus six uh, and 38. So here is a way to produce uh, a knot uh, that is not uh, H slice in K3. Now we haven't talked 
about smooth indefinite four manifolds yet. So we've seen bounds for uh, X def uh, definite uh, and for, and we have seen topological bounds. So let us now tackle the question of smooth indefinite four manifolds. And this is basically the new contribution that we give. Uh, we use two techniques. The first technique is by, a by using adjunction inequalities. So we consider a four manifold X together with uh, a spin C structure, um, which I am not going to define. Uh, it is uh, some object to which you can associate a second cohomology class uh, that you call the first churn class uh, of the spin C structure. This is basically all we need. So from S, you can compute C1 of S in H upper two of X. And given such a pair, you can define the cyber witten invariant of XS or the Oshvat sabo invariant of XS. Uh, there are also conditions on uh, B2 plus uh, that I am sweeping under the rug. Then uh, these are invariants of the pair uh, XS assuming B2 plus is at least two. Then a theorem of Kronheimer and Rovka for the cyber witten invariants and of Oshvat and Sabo for uh, uh, the Oshvat Sabo in invariant is that if B2 plus uh, is greater than one and X is uh, of simple type, which is some uh, uh, technical condition on these invariants, and if sigma is closed, uh, smooth, uh, and embedded in X uh, with positive genus, then if uh, either the cyber witten invariants or the oshvat sau invariants are, are non-zero, then you get an inequality uh, that you see here on the right. So phi of XS here denotes either the cyber witten invariants or the oshvat sau invariants. But somehow the key condition here is that sigma has to be closed. So it doesn't quite fit uh, our uh, setting because we are considering uh, knots in S3 that found a certain surface in a four ball. So how can we fix this problem? So here is uh, our strategy. We start from a knot K in S3 that bounds some surface uh, sigma in X punctured, and we want to place restrictions on the genus of sigma. Well, we can always try to find some surface F with boundary the mirror of K, K bar, sitting inside some four manifold uh, Z. And then we can glue Z and uh, X punctured to get a closed four manifold and a closed surface sitting inside it. And now we can apply the adjunction inequality here because we now have uh, everything closed. So this is the strategy that we are going to apply in three cases. Uh, is the general idea okay? All right, so here's the baby case, case number zero. We can pick Z to be the easiest possible four manifold with boundary, namely the four ball. And we can pick F to be a genus minimizing surface for K bar. Then the genus of F would be exactly the four, uh, the slice genus of K bar. So in this case, the theorem that we get is that uh, C1 of S paired with sigma plus sigma squared is bounded by twice the genus of sigma minus two plus twice the four, uh, uh, the slice genus of K. So this is exactly the same as we had up here, except that the genus of, uh, of sigma is corrected uh, uh, we, uh, with uh, genus of sigma plus the, uh, the four ball genus of K. All right, but we can actually do better because in this case, uh, we, are in, we may be increasing the genus of sigma by a lot. 
So instead, we can consider a case where F can be taken to be a disk. And Z is a two-handle attached along K. So basically, we just take Z to be the minimum uh, that you need, the minimum for uh, manifold that you need to have a disk sitting inside it with boundary K. So Z is a thickened uh, disk in this case. So in such a case, the theorem that we get is essentially the same as before, except that uh, the four ball genus of K is replaced by a new plus of K bar. And this is a good news because uh, new plus of K bar is always uh, less than or equal to the four ball genus. So we get uh, a better in we don't get a worse inequality and there are cases where this is actually better. For example, uh, when X is K3, you can choose uh, a spin C structure uh, with uh, zero first term class. This is actually uh, uh, the, uh, this first term class uh, is uh, the canonical uh, and, uh, uh, and then it satisfies the condition that uh, uh, the cyber beta invariants are non-zero, and so do uh, the Oshvat Sabo invariants. Then uh, theorem zero tells us uh, that uh, if uh, uh, if you have a surface sigma with boundary the right-handed trefoil and uh, positive self-intersection, then the genus uh, is positive. But theorem one says something more because it says that the genus is actually greater than one. All right, now there's one more case where I would like to apply the strategy of plugging in a fourth manifold with a surface sitting inside it. And that's uh, for, uh, uh, for the case of Z being uh, a punctured uh, symplectic fourth manifold. So in this case, the theorem looks a little more complicated. Suppose that X and W are closed uh, symplectic fourth manifolds uh, with D2 plus congruent uh, to three mod four. This is required so that uh, the cyber beaten invariants are non-vanishing. Then if you have that, if you have a disk uh, delta in W punctured with, uh, uh, with boundary K bar and with the extra condition that uh, delta is null homologous, but it squares to zero, then K cannot be H slice in X. So this is all very complicated, but the important sentence is one, namely this one. It gives us a way to find a knot that is not H slice in X. So let's see a sketch of the proof. We prove it by contradiction. So by contradiction, we assume that there exists a D2, some disk with boundary K in X punctured. Then we can glue it to the disk delta sitting in W. And now what we get is a zero framed sphere. So that's a sphere in homology class non-zero and with a square equal to zero. Now this is notoriously bad in gauge theory. And this is impossible if uh, say the cyber beaten invariants of the Oshvat sub invariants are non-zero. Now there's a problem here because we have a connected sum and the cyber written invariant and the Oshvat Sabo invariant vanish on connected sums, assuming that B2 plus is positive on both of them. So the way we fix it is by using powerful root as a cohomotopic refinement of the cyber written invariants. Uh, these are somehow some finite dimensional approximation of the cyber beaten equations uh, and they give uh, um, uh, they give uh, uh, some uh, invariants that may not vanish uh, even for connected sums. And, uh, uh, and in particular we get that in this case uh, uh, 
when uh, X and W are closed symplectic four manifolds with B2 plus uh, congruent to three mod four, uh, uh, the invariant for the connected sum is non zero. All right. Now I claim that uh, this theorem has very interesting corollaries. I'll try to keep it here as long as possible. So the first corollary is that the right handed trefoil is not H slice uh, in K3 and even, oh, actually. Not showing. For some reason, it froze. Oh, now maybe you see it. Okay. Uh, does everyone see it now? Okay. So now you can also see the corollary. The right handed trefoil is not each slice in K3 or even K3 blown up once. And the proof is by using the corollary. Mm. So we mentioned earlier that the, life, the left handed trefoil bounds a disk in K3 that squares to zero, but that is not null homologous. Then we can use theorem two with W equal to K3 and X equal to K3 connected sum with CP2 bar. And, uh, and then we get that uh, uh, the mirror of the left handed trifle cannot be H slice in X. Even more interestingly, we have that the right handed trefoil is not H slice in X, which is K3 connected sum CP2 bar, but it is actually H slice in 20 connected, uh, uh, in 20 copies of CP2 bar connected sum with three copies of CP2, essentially because it is already H slice in CP2. Um, so this was uh, one of the, the examples what, that we saw at the very beginning when I talked about CP2, I mentioned that the right-handed trefoil is H slice in there. And these are two very interesting four manifolds because they are homeomorphic to each other uh, by Friedman. So what we have here is actually an exotic pair of four manifolds X and X prime, which are distinguished by H sliceness. The right hand, uh, the right handed trifle is, is H slice in one of them and not in the other. So that's the spoiler that I mentioned at the very beginning. A corollary of the corollary of the corollary is that uh, the right handed trifle is topologically H slice in X, but not smoothly H slice in X. The fact that it is not smoothly H slice in X is uh, is the first corollary. So why is it topologically H slice uh, in X? Well, we know that uh, the right handed trefoil bounds a disk in X prime, but now X prime is homeomorphic to X. So it also bounds uh, some uh, uh, topological disk uh, in X. And this is an interesting result because this is an example where the difference between topological, uh, the topological and the smooth category is really inherent to X and is not uh, coming from S4. So the right-handed trifle is not topologically H slice in, uh, in S4. Uh, so you really need to use the topology of X to get uh, a topologically H slice disk. So, uh, how are we going so far? I still have uh, another page with another technique. For, okay. Oh, actually, no, I forgot that I added uh, this bit uh, about other uh, adjunction inequalities that you can find in the literature. So there are adjunction inequalities by Mrovka and Rollin and Gadgil and Kulkarni. 
But these are for smooth four manifolds with the contact and convex boundary. So they wouldn't apply for punctured K3, for instance. And there's another recent uh, uh, adjunction inequality by Ida, Mukherjee, and Taniguchi. It's actually from this year. Um, and I'll probably talk a little more about it later because they find some very interesting examples. So now I would like to talk about a different technique to obstruct, uh, uh, to give relative genus bounds, or actually to obstruct uh, H sliceness, which is given by Furuta's 10-8 theorem. So Furuta's theorem says that if you have a, a spin closed indefinite for manifold X, then somehow its second betty number has to be rather big uh, if compared to the signature. So it's at least uh, 10 eighths uh, times the signature plus two. And Donald and Vafai use it, used it uh, to abstract sliceness uh, in S4, that is classical sliceness. But really their proof can be adapted uh, to give uh, obstructions to H sliceness. So suppose that uh, K is an H slice uh, um, not uh, in a spin for manifold X, and let uh, W be a spin to a spin to handle body with boundary the zero surgery on K. Then, uh, if B two plus of X plus B two W uh, B two of W is not uh, one of these three numbers one three and twenty three, then we have a Furuta style inequality involving B2 of X plus B2 of W and Sigma of X minus Sigma of W. And the idea of the proof is relatively, uh, is relatively simple. You consider V to be X minus a neighborhood of uh, the, H slice, uh, the H slice disk. And then you apply Furuta's theorem to minus V union W. In fact, you really apply some refinement of Furuta's theorem by Hopkins, Lin, Xi, and Chu. But here, are, here is an application. So KDV is this beautiful knot uh, where the figure is taken from uh, Donald Vafai's paper. And they proved using Furuta's theorem that KDV is topologically sliced in S4. Well, they proved that uh, KDV is topologically H slice, uh, is topologically sliced in S4. And uh, using Furuta's theorem, they proved that it is not uh, slice, uh, not smoothly sliced in S4. What we can do is that uh, we can prove that KDV is actually not H slice even in K3. So uh, I mentioned earlier the work of uh, Ida, Mukherjee, and uh, Taniguchi. And I want to mention it a little more now uh, because uh, they actually produ produced more examples more recently. So I think it's a very interesting result. Uh, so in particular, they produced an infinite family of knots with the following properties. The knots are linearly independent uh, in the concordance group. They are all topologically sliced in S4, and they are slice, but not H slice in the K3 surface. So they are somehow kind of similar to this KDV, although we do not know whether KDV is H slice, uh, um, sorry, whether KDV is slice in, uh, um, in K3 or not. And this is the last uh, section. I have uh, some open questions for you. So the first one is, uh, to me, the most interesting one. Are all knots sliced in the K3 surface? Um, 
We have no idea. Uh, we found a lot of examples of slice knots in the case resurface. I mentioned earlier a lot of uh, all the knots with a knotting number uh, at most two. But we do not have any examples of, an, uh, of a knot that is not slice in K3. And this should really be compared with the fact that uh, all knots are slice in S2 cross S2 and uh, CP2 connected some uh, with CP2 bar. And these are uh, the easiest uh, indefinite for manifolds uh, and they are, I would say, well understood. So a straight, uh, a, naive generally, a naive conjecture would be that maybe for all indefinite for manifolds, uh, uh, all knots are slice, but we really have no idea. And another question is whether the set of slice knots can detect uh, exotic pairs. We know that the answer is yes for the set of H slice knots, but we have no idea for slice knots uh, without any restriction on the homology class. And finally, given a closed smooth four manifold X, is there always a knot K that is topologically but not smoothly H slice in X? We also have no idea. So that's the end. Uh, thank you, Martha. Yeah. Thanks a lot for. Okay. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Great. Are there any any questions? Else has a question. I, I mean, I had a question about one of your earlier constructions. You took the site, the, the sort of the obstruction from Cybic Witten and the Oswath Zabo invariance. And you said you glued on a two handle. Uh, yes. So, some this one, some I guess. Uh, yeah. It's not a result for closed manifolds. Correct. So, uh, yes. Uh, so, you can't really apply. Uh, the theorem uh, that I mentioned up here by Oshvat and Sabo, because that was for closed manifold. But you can uh, you can extend uh, Oshvat and Sabo's theorem uh, to encompass uh, uh, for manifolds with boundary, as long as the surface uh, is uh, still uh, closed. Uh, so can be extended. to x with boundary of x uh, non-empty. Somehow you need uh, a definition of, uh, uh, of the Oshbat sub invariant for, uh, uh, for manifolds with boundary. This was actually already sketched uh, in uh, Oshbat and Sabo's first paper. The idea is that you start with hf minus of s3. Uh, this maybe gets a little more. Okay, maybe, you know, uh, I'll, I will not sketch the construction because not everyone may be familiar with it, but somehow you can do a similar construction, construct a mixed invariant also for, um, for, for manifolds with boundary. And then the same theorem more or less applies uh, after you change uh, what has to be changed. Can't you use the Kronheim and Rovka invariant, which is for boundary, which is for four manifolds with none? empty boundary and it sort of has a prescribed behavior at infinity uh, you know what i'm uh, no um are you talking about the cyber written uh, invariant yeah. or okay uh of course you need a non-vanishing there right yes yes you need a non-vanishing result so you need uh, so we did it with uh, the Oshvat Sabo mixed invariant because you can easily compute uh, when uh, 
when the two handle attach uh, when the two handle induces a non-trivial map and Why then the invariant i don't understand so there is an adjunction formula for cobordisms right no so i can tell you what we more uh, what we do um, so we start uh, with uh, the manifold X and here we have uh, uh, the mixed map from let's say HF minus of S3 to HF plus of uh, uh, well okay let's say S3 again and now we also have uh, the condition that uh, the manifold X is of simple type uh, so if X is of simple type, uh, then you know that uh, the generator uh, of HF minus goes to the bottom element of the tower uh, of, HS, uh, of HF plus. And now when you attach uh, a two handle, then you have a map from HF plus of S3 to HF plus of the surgery, which you can compute. So uh, here you assume some non-vanishing, right? Yes, yeah, we okay. assume some non-vanishing. We assume that, where is uh, oh yes, I didn't state it again, but yes, we do assume that uh, phi, uh, that X is of simple type. Now I understand, okay. Okay, it actually also works for uh, the other case. Um, so there are two adjunction inequalities. One is when X is of simple type, and the other one I now forget. Uh, for me, it seems Marco has frozen. Hello. Yep. Um. <laughs> that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He'll be back in a minute. You can just imagine that he was actually giving a real talk and he, someone asked a difficult question, so he stopped to think for 30 seconds and said nothing, which is, of course, completely normal. <laughs> but you pretend... I think doesn't... I am back. Okay, very good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, but you'll have to repeat whatever you were asking if you were asking anything because I was frozen. No, well, that's okay. I, I see now. I see what's okay. happening. Any, any other questions for Marco? If not, let's, uh, let's thank him again. An excellent talk. Well, thank you for uh, for listening to it. <laughs>